What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about translation or protein synthesis. But before we get started, if you guys do like this video, if you guys benefit from this video, the best way that you guys can support us to continue to keep making free videos for you guys' enjoyment is by subscribing to us, as well as hitting that like button and commenting down in the comment section. That really helps us to continue to grow as a channel. Also, down in the description box, we'll have a link to our Patreon. If you guys go to our Patreon, we'll there we'll have access to illustrations and notes that we are continuously adding and growing every single day. But there is a limited amount at this time, but go check it out and to see if it can help you in your academic journey. All right, engineers, so let's start translation. When we talk about translation, we have to have a basic definition of what the heck it is. And that is you're taking RNA. In this case, what type of RNA? We really is our primary one that we're gonna focus on, mRNA. We're taking that mRNA that we made from DNA. What was that process called? Transcription. So we're taking the mRNA that we got from DNA and now we're going to make proteins. That is the process of translation, taking RNA and making proteins. There's so many different types of RNA. The three main ones that I need you guys to remember that are crucial for translation is mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. And we'll go through these as well as a couple other things before we get into the phases of translation. The first thing that we need to talk about is this concept of the genetic code. Okay. It's really simple. It's not as like scary as it seems. A little boring, but we're going to make it fun. The first thing that you need to know is here we have a molecule of mRNA, right? So this is our mRNA. Now, mRNA is very, very important for this translation process, right? Messenger RNA. Messenger RNA, it has a very specific sequence of nucleotides, if you will, that are in these triplet forms. You see how this is a, there's three little lines there. That line is a nucleotide, that's a nucleotide, that's a nucleotide. So there's three nucleotides there. And we have a couple of these spanned along the length of this mRNA molecule, right? And the other thing you need to know is the orientation, right? So a little bit about the topology of the mRNA. On this end, I'm going to have a five prime cap. Do you guys remember that whole process we talked about in post-transcriptional modification? This is the five prime end. On this end, you have the three prime end. And we had on this end, do you guys remember what happened here in the transcription process? We added the poly A tail on that end, right? So on the mRNA, you have a five prime end, a three prime end, and sequences of nucleotides within it. These sequences of nucleotides that are in these triplet forms along the mRNA are given a very special name that you need to remember. And these are called codons. So let's write that down. So these things, these triplets, let's put down triplets. Triplets of what? Triplets of nucleotides, okay? And you guys need to remember the nucleotides in RNA are different than the nucleotides in DNA. Let's write down primarily the nitrogenous bases that are associated with RNA. What are they? We'll represent that by kind of just the single letter abbreviation. One is you have adenine, right? That's one of the nitrogenous bases in RNA. Then you have guanine, cytosine, and uh, what else? If you guys said thymine, I'm gonna be really upset with you. It's not thymine, it's uracil. In RNA, it's uracil. That's the big difference between DNA, it has thymine, and RNA, it has uracil, okay? So, we have codons, are triplets of nucleotides. What type of nucleotides? Nucleotides that contain these four nitrogenous bases. Okay, now, here's the next thing I need you guys to know. We know what they are, how many are there? <sighs> Let's take this, let's do a little bit of math. I know it's a little boring, but let's take and do a little bit of math here. We have the triplets, we described that, what those triplets are made up of. And let's talk about how many of these triplets of these four nucleotides you can have. Well, there's four total nucleotides, right? So let's put a four here. Four different types of combinations of nucleotides. Each one of, there's three of these nucleotides in a codon. So if I take four, raise it to the third power, what does that give me? 64. 64 possible codons based upon the four nucleotides I have and that there's three nucleotides in that codon. So that means that there are 64 different possibilities of codons. Okay, so what do we need to know here? That there's 64 different types of codons. 
Now, we gotta talk a teensy little bit about the different types. We're not gonna go through every single one of them. That's unnecessary. You'll have these. If you guys don't go into the back of your textbook and like an appendix, you'll have the entire genetic code that you guys can look at. There's no need to memorize them, but you need to know a couple things about these 64 different types of codons. And what should you know? The next thing you should know is that when you take these 64 codons, okay, that are triplets, and we'll kind of talk about them, 61 of those codons read, you read them, right? And we'll give you an example here for an example. Uh, like, let's give you an example now. Let's say I take a codon, right, which is a triplet, and it contains one of these, three of those nucleotides. Let's use the example A, U, G. That's a codon. If I look in the back of the textbook at that genetic code kind of thing, and I see AUG, it's going to code for an amino acid. And that amino acid is very specific to that codon. And so what type would it be? This one's an easy one to remember, and this is probably one of the few that you should remember and memorize, but this is methionine. And methionine is an amino acid. So out of the 64 codons, 61 of them, right, in this kind of form, three nucleotides, which there's so many different types of possibilities, will code for an amino acid. I'm just giving you an example. So out of these 61 codons, they code for an amino acid. So very important to remember that, okay? Out of the remaining, how many are remaining? 61, there's three codons left that we have to talk about. These other three codons, do not code for an amino acid. They code for terminating the translation process. And these are called stop codons. And we'll get into these a little bit more in detail when we go through the phases of translation, but you can remember these by the mnemonic, or kind of like the phrase, if you will, a little memory trick, which is you go away. You are away. You are gone. These do not code for an amino acid. So in other words, if I were to look in the genetic code in the back of the textbook, these would not give you a particular amino acid. They would stop the translation process. So that's important and we'll go over what that kind of looks like a little bit later. So basic concept I want you guys to get out of the genetic code particularly is mRNA contains codons. Codons are made up of nucleotides. How many? Three, what are the particular types of nucleotides? They have to contain adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. There's how many different types of codons? So many, 64. Do you need to know all of them? No. Out of those 64, 61 of them code for amino acids. You can look at all those up in the textbook. Three of them do not code for amino acids. They stop the translation process. That's all I want you to know about that. The other aspect of the genetic code is that we need something that's gonna carry. So we said that these codons code for amino acids. How the heck do they do that? You guys should be asking that question. There's another molecule called tRNA, right? What is it called? tRNA, transfer RNA. Transfer RNA, if you guys kind of look at the structure of it, it contains what's called anticodons. Let's write that down. So it contains anticodons. Okay, that's the first thing. What the heck are anticodons? It's really simple. Anticodons are a triplet, all right? So three nucleotides that are complementary to the codons in mRNA. That's it. So what are they? They are th a triplet of nucleotides that are complementary to codons in the mRNA. That is it. The other aspect of this is, there's some enzymes we'll talk about a little bit later. So there's a funky little enzyme that'll come and it's kind of like a little bit, you know, it's a little gropey. Grabs the uh, anticodon portion, reads it, says, okay, I got the anticodon there. All right, so I know what it is. I need to find an amino acid that is very specific, right, to the codons that this anticodon is complementary to. So let's, get, let's give the example here. Let's say the codon that you have an anticodon complementary to is this one, AUG. Okay, so let's give the example here that you have a codon. Uh, we're going to use this example here. So let's say here we have a codon, and the codon is AUG. What would the anticodon be? has to be complementary to this. So the anticodon for this example would be UAC, 
right? Because they're, comp they're complementary to each other, right? You guys remember that, that if it's A, that's complementary with U. That G is complementary with C, and technically these should be triple bonds, right? So this would be A is complementary with U, U is complementary with A, and G is complementary with C. So we'll go U, A, C. What will happen is the tRNA enzyme that'll come in, we'll talk about later, it'll say, oh, UAC, that's complementary to AUG. If I go into my genetic code, because it's got all of it in its head, this enzyme, it says AUG is specific for what amino acid? Methionine. So then this enzyme takes and we use a particular amino acid domain, we'll call it. There's a specific amino acid domain on this tRNA that we'll talk about, and that is going to have, carry the amino acid specific to this codon. What was the amino acid? Methionine. So it'll carry the methionine in this example. Now, let's talk a little bit about this kind of like anatomy or structure of the tRNA that kind of coincides with what we just talked about. If we take the tRNA, the first thing is where are the anticodons? The anticodons, if you look at it, tRNA kind of has the shape of a, a T in a way, right? On this portion, this bottom loopy portion, this right here is where you'll have your anticodons on this portion. So this is the part of the tRNA that'll interact with the codons in the mRNA. The next portion here is you have another loop. I'm not really too worried about you knowing about these loops. This portion here though, okay, this is called the five prime end of the tRNA. So what would be on that end? What group? Hydroxyl group or phosphate group, engineers? Phosphate group. This end over here, which has like the little copper loopy thing, is the three prime end. Three prime end contains what? OH or uh, phosphate group? Contains the hydroxyl group or the OH group. But there's also a very specific sequence of nucleotides that are in this area of the three prime end which hold on to the amino acid. This is the amino acid holding domain. And this is containing CCA. So we'll put the three prime CCA domain or region on the tRNA. What is this portion? The little cup that holds on to what? What will bind in here? So here you have CCA. It'll bind on to the amino acid. In this case, it was what? Methionine. If the anticodon is UAC, which is complementary to AUG. Holy crap, we went through all of that. All right, so the next thing we gotta talk about is the characteristics of the genetic code. I don't wanna go too long into this, so let's just breeze over it really quick. But it's things that can be asked in your exam, so you should know it. When we talk about the genetic code, all the stuff we talked about with the codons, the anticodons, the mRNA, tRNA, all that good stuff, when we take the mRNA and we read it, right, from five prime end to three prime end, for the most part, there's a couple exceptions, you start at the five prime end and you go to the three prime end continuously. You don't like have any stops or anything like that. So in that way, when we talk about the genetic code, this translation process, understanding the genetic code, is what's referred to as commaless. So what does that mean? Here's a codon, right? I'm gonna read this codon, utilizing the tRNA and the ribosomes, and I'm gonna give an amino acid. Then I'm gonna to go to the next codon, read that, make amino acids. And I'll keep going down this way, going through each sequence of three nucleotides or a triplet. Now, what, what does this mean that it's commaless? Let's say that I read this codon, read this codon, and there's a couple nucleotides in between, to between this next codon that I wanna read. I don't skip these nucleotides and go to the next codon, okay? So this, this thing does not happen. You don't go three nucleotides, read three nucleotides next, and then skip a couple nucleotides and go to the three next nucleotides. It's consistent. This does not happen in the genetic code or the translation process. The only exception to this is viruses. They're the only exception. So we'll put exception to this where they can have some type of translation process that does have commas in it, or you kind of skip a couple nucleotides, okay? The next thing that we need to know about the genetic code is that not only is it commaless, but it's non-overlapping. What does that mean? That means that when I read these, again, five prime to three prime, I'm gonna read it all the way down continuously. I'm gonna read this codon, give an amino acid. Read this codon, give an amino acid. What I'm not going to do is read this codon, give an amino acid, but then, let's do a different color. 
start here at the second nucleotide, read these three, and give an amino acid. Then let's do one more color. Start at this third nucleotide after, and read here, and give an amino acid. That does not happen in the translation process according to the genetic code. There is one exception, and again, that exception is that this overlapping process can occur in viruses. That is the only exception. Okay? So the, the, when someone says, can you give me characteristics of the genetic code, you will say it is commonless, it occurs continuously from five to three, and non-overlapping, continuous from five to three. The only exceptions are viruses, that's it. The next thing that you need to know is a little bit more important than this gibberish up here. And that is that the genetic code is what's called redundant. So it's redundant and it's degenerate, okay? So it has degeneracy or it's degenerate. So let me explain what that means. Let's say I have a, a couple codons and I'm gonna actually give specific nucleotide sequences to. I'm gonna give this a nucleotide sequence of A, U, A, A, U, C, and A, U, U, okay? Now, here's what's really interesting about these. I have three different codons. These three codons, you would probably say each one of them codes for you know, a different amino acid, but you'd be wrong. And that's where redundancy or degeneracy comes in. If you guys look in the back of your textbooks or the appendix where the genetic code is, if you were to look, there is an amino acid called isoleucine. And if you take isoleucine and you try to track back to its codon, you'll find that it has three different types of codons that it can actually code for it. And that is AUA. A U C and A U U. That's really interesting. So that tells me that I could know the amino acid that I'm making, but I won't be able to track it back to one to the specific codon. There's two exceptions to that, and that is um, if you truly want to know it, the only exceptions to this concept of redundancy or degeneracy, the exceptions are methionine. So we'll put here methionine and what's called uh, tryptophan. And, here, and let's, I want you guys to think about why these would be exceptions, because it actually does help. Methionine, there was only one codon. What was it? AUG. Tryptophan only has one codon. I, you, know, you don't need to know this, but it's UGG. There's no other codons that code for these amino acids. There's just one. So they're the only exceptions. All the other amino acids have multiple codons that code for it. So that's the concept of redundancy. Now here's the thing, you guys are like, how the heck does that happen? I asked this question when I was learning it. So let's take an example here. Let's say here I have my mRNA, right? And again, this is my five prime end. This is my three prime end of the mRNA. Let's say I start here, and I'm gonna go in sequence here. So the sequence is which one? Let's kind of keep these colors. We'll do red here for the mRNA. So this is going to be which ones? A, U, A. A, U, C, and the next one is A, U, U. How the heck does the tRNA do that in a particular way? Does each anticodon have to be different? Because I thought they have to know the tRNA an enzyme that we talked about kind of like a little bit, so it has to read the anticodon and it has to be complementary to the codon to give me this amino acid. How does it do that? Here's the way it does it. There's something called the wobble effect. Wobble, baby, wobble, baby, wobble, right? And it's called the wobble effect or the wobble phenomenon. Let's write that down and let's talk about what the heck that is. So let's take, and this is particularly for the tRNA that kind of allows this process to occur. It's pretty cool. So where's the anticodon on the tRNA? Here's our tRNA, where would it be? On this bottom loop. What would it have to be specifically? You would say, oh, complementary to A is U, complementary to U is A, complementary to A is U. But here's where it's different. On this position, what was this point here on the tRNA? This point here. This was the five prime end, right? What's this portion here? The three prime end. So going from five prime of the tRNA to the three prime of the tRNA, right? Because if you kind of follow this down like that, so you start five prime, this would be the first position. This would be the second, this would be the third position, and then you continue to work your way back up. On this first position on the five prime end, it's actually containing 
a, something called inosine. You're like, what the heck? Believe me, I thought that too. So the same thing, we'll talk about what that does in a second, but let's go to the next one. Same thing, you'll read this here, you have your five prime, three prime, and it'll have come down, the first one will be inosine, and then what will you have? What's complementary to you? A. What's complementary to A? U. Do the same thing over here. Start at five prime, three prime for the tRNA, work your way down, first one has to be I, next one will be what? A, and the next one will be U. Let's explain what happens with all of this. Do you notice a difference here? Remember I told you that the uh, enzyme has to read that anticodon. It has to be complementary to the codons in the mRNA to pick the correct amino acid. Well, do you notice how all of these are different? They all differ in that third position on their codon and they differ on this kind of like first position in the anticodon. Here's how this happens. Inosine, Okay, that I I'm representing with is actually called inosine. Inosine is not talked about too often in the Watson and Crick model, you know, in your DNA stuff, the interactions, complementarity stuff. Inosine is complementary to adenine. Inosine is complementary to uracil. Inosine is complementary to cytosine. So whenever you have something like this, where the third position is A, C, and U, on the tRNA, they can have an inosine that can be complementary to A, complementary to U, and complementary to C, and still give you the same amino acid, which would be what? I already told you this would be isoleucine, isoleucine, isoleucine. Okay? So that's called the wobble effect. You're probably like, why the heck do we do this? Why don't we just make it specific to each of these types of um, you know, codons? Why don't we just make it UAU, UAG, uh, UAA? Why don't we do that? And the reason why is the wobble effect reduces the risk. It decreases the risk of mutations. So, so what do I mean by it can decrease the risk of mutation? It can, and specifically, it can decrease the risk of mutations. How, how does it do that? It's all based upon this fact that if I have any mutations in the DNA, that'll lead to mutations in the mRNA. And if there's mutations in the mRNA, I'm going to have changes like substitutions or things like that in the codons. And if I kind of substitute or switch up some of the nucleotides, I'll code for a different amino acid particularly. So if I have a little bit of that wobble effect, I have a little bit of uh, you know, wiggle room in that, that, that first position on the tRNA, I may reduce the risk of giving a wrong amino acid leading to an abnormally structured protein. So that's kind of the big effect here is when we talk about redundancy or degeneracy, it's that one amino acid can have multiple codons with just these two exceptions. And how does that work? via the wobble effect in tRNA, where on that first position on the five prime end of the anticodon, it is an inosine, which has multiple complementarities with A, U, C. Whole purpose of this is to decrease the risk of mutations. So when we're talking about, when I'm mentioning all this stuff about the genetic code, and you can look in your textbooks, I use Marieb, um, kind of a human anatomy and physiology book. And again, you can find the, in the appendix all the information about that genetic code. But you can find this in various textbooks, Campbell's Biology as well. Uh, but again, I'm just referring to in any book, you'll have that appendix to talk about the genetic code so that you guys know what I'm talking about here. All right, so we got a pretty decent idea about the genetic code, right? I'm talking about codons, anticodons, and some of the features of it, our characteristics. The next thing I want to talk about is tRNA a little bit. And I want to go through something called tRNA charging. We'll, talk, we'll review the structure of the tRNA really briefly as a nice like, little review. But we're going to talk about this process called tRNA charging, which is very important uh, when we talk about the translation process. So here we have our tRNA molecule, right? So this is our tRNA, transfer RNA. Tiny little guy, right? Again, what is this end here that doesn't have the little kind of like little socket or pocket there where the amino acids bind. What is this end? This is your five prime end. What's this end? This is your three prime end, which contains the OH group, but particularly what nucleotide sequence? C, C, A. What binds here? This is the amino acid kind of like binding domain, if you will. So this is where an amino acid will bind, correct? Now, 
This arm was the one I really wanted you to focus with. We had the three loops. We'll briefly talk about these other two loops. Not super worried if you guys know it, but here in this bottom loop, what do we have down here? On this bottom loop, you contain the anticodons. And the anticodons will be in a triplet form. And these triplets can be in the form of, again, containing nitrogenous bases like what? Adenine, you know, adenine, guanine, uracil, and uh, the cytosine, okay? So again, this portion here will be what? This will be the anticodon portion, okay? The last thing here is these two little arms or loops and this little thing that's kind of like sticking out the side. This portion here, near that three prime end, this is called the T arm. So what is this portion here called, near the three prime end? This is called the T arm. The T arm, what you really need to know about this is that it tethers the tRNA to the ribosome. That's all I want you guys to know, is that it tethers the tRNA to the ribosome. So it kind of is one of the big things that allows for interaction between the tRNA to the ribosome. Okay, that's it. This other arm over here, this loop near the five prime end, this is called the D arm. And the D arm is what allows for the identification of the tRNA by the enzyme called tRNA, the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. So it allows for identification, identification of the tRNA by what's called the, uh, we'll just, we'll have a basic thing, tRNA synthetase enzyme. Okay? So basic concept here, you have the five prime end, then you have the first arm, which is the D arm. It allows for the uh, identification of the tRNA by the tRNA synthetase. Anticodons on the bottom loop. T arm is near the three prime end. That allows for the tRNA to interact with the ribosome. Three prime end has the CCA domain, which allows for it to interact with amino acids. This last thing here, I'm not really concerned if you guys truly know it, it's the invariable domain. It's, uh, it's, it, can, it, I mean, it can actually, it's the variable domain, it can change from tRNA to tRNA. Nothing too big to know about that portion. Okay, so you have the basic structure of the tRNA. The next thing I need you guys to know about is called charging. So, this is really simple. It's a basically talking about how do we get the amino acid to bind on to that three prime end? That's all it is, and it's really simple. Here I have an amino acid, okay? So here's my amino acid. And let's, let's use this example that we've continuously been using a lot. Let's say that we're, we're gonna start the translation process, and let's just pretend, for example, here's my mRNA. Okay, and let's use this example that this is AUG. What would the anticodons be if we were to kind of write them in here? If it was AUG, it would be UAC. What is that AUG code for? Methionine. We've already said that multiple times, right? So let's say here's our, here's our example. This is our methionine. We'll just abbreviate it as MET, okay? What we're gonna do is, the first step we're gonna do in this process is we're going to add an ATP molecule onto it. We're gonna add an ATP molecule onto the methionine. So let's say that here, I use an ATP and I add it into this process here, okay? Then what I'll have here is I'll have my amino acid, and what happens is when the ATP gets added in, it actually, we break two of the phosphate groups off of the ATP, okay? So if we break two phosphate groups off, that gives you what's called a pyrophosphate, and so the only thing that's kind of hanging onto this amino acid is an AMP. They want you to know these kinds of names of it, right? So when I take this amino acid and add on an AMP, it's called, I know it's annoying, it's called the amino acyl AMP molecule, okay? Then, here's the next thing. We have this amino acyl AMP and we have that three prime kind of amino acid domain with the CCA portion. Imagine, we draw a big old enzyme here. So here's this enzyme, okay? Here's this enzyme. This enzyme has in one end, it's holding the tRNA, right? So it's holding that tRNA molecule. So we're just gonna, we're gonna draw a very generic structure of it. Here's gonna just be this process here, okay? So here's the generic structure, and we'll just kind of show that this is our three prime end, right there, 
okay? Just generic. It's holding in one pocket this tRNA molecule. In the other pocket, it's holding the amino acid with what bound to it? The AMP. Then what it does is, it basically just says, hey, let me make sure that this anticodon is appropriate. Is it appropriate to the mRNA codon that we need? Oh, it is good. Clicks them together. And so it takes and adds that amino acid with the AMP onto the three prime CCA region. So let's draw the little cup. What was that little cup thing? The CCA portion. It'll add on, this reaction will occur. So we're gonna just fuse these two things together. And when we fuse these two things together, what do you get? You'll get this structure where you'll have the tRNA with the little cup and what will be kind of sitting in that little pocket there, the amino acid. And what amino acid was this in this example? Methionine. In the process though, do you see AMP still bound to it? No. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna release the AMP during that process, okay? What you need to know is what the heck is this enzyme? This enzyme is called the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. I kind of quickly abbreviated it for you, like a shorthand version of it when we talked about it with the D-arm. That's the enzyme I'm really referring to, is the amino acyl tRNA synthetase. And if you really wanted to remember what part of the TNA is keeping it kind of like identified, the D-arm of the tRNA will allow for it to be identified. Okay? So, to recap really quickly, I want to take the amino acid, put it on the three prime end. What do I have to do? First thing, take the amino acid, add an ATP onto it. I'll pop off a pyrophosphate, so I'm truly only adding a AMP. That's called an amino acyl AMP. A amino acyl tRNA synthetase will come in, have two pockets. In one pocket, it'll hold the amino acyl AMP. In the other pocket, it'll bind the tRNA with no amino acid. It'll read, make sure that it's the proper anticodon that is complementary to the codon of mRNA, click them together. When it clicks them together, it puts the amino acid on the three prime end and spits out the AMP. Now what do I have? A charged tRNA. So what is this thing here called? This is called a charged tRNA. Okay, that's the process. That's all I really want you to know out of this, okay? So, let's now move on to the next thing, which is saying, okay, we've already talked about mRNA, we talked about codons, anticodons, some features, we talked about tRNA charging. Now we need to get into these things called ribosomes a little bit. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about ribosomes and, and what are their kind of significance, because we're gonna go into all these phases of translation. It's all gonna make sense. It might seem like a little bit scattered right now, but I promise, we're really building our foundation so we truly understand the translation process. So the next thing we need to talk about is these ribosomes. Ribosomes are definitely very, very crucial for translation, as well as the mRNA and the tRNA. But some of the things that you guys need to know, particularly, is the difference in ribosomes between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And there is a very brief clinical uh, significance that we'll uh, talk about with that. So let's say here I have ribosomes, and they're interacting with the mRNA, and they will interact with the tRNA. But we're gonna talk about these specific differences between eukaryotes and prokaryotes, because this is something that you guys will be asked. Eukaryotic cells, when we talk about ribosomes, they have two subunits, okay? We're gonna say this subunit up here is bigger than this one down here, right? So it's pretty straightforward. This is the large uh, subunit or ribosomal subunit. And then this one down here is the small ribosomal subunit, okay? Now, these have different ways that we can um, kind of like describe their size, okay, large and small, according to a Zved Zvedberg unit. And eukaryotic cells, that Zvedberg unit for large ribosomal subunits are called 60S, large ribosomal subunits. And the small in eukaryotic cells are called 40S, ribosomal subunits. But we sometimes generally in textbooks refer to them as 80S, ribosomes in eukaryotic cells. You're probably like, Zach, that, those numbers do not make any sense. 60 plus 40 is 100, Zach. What are you, losing your brain? I promise you the, the way that they do this via the Zvedberg unit 
um, gives you an ADS ribosomal subunit for eukaryotic cells. In prokaryotic cells, it's the same concept. Again, we're not gonna write these down, but this is your large. Here, we'll put large ribosomal subunit, small ribosomal subunit. In prokaryotic cells, the large one is a 50S ribosome, and then in prokaryotics, the small is a 30S ribosomal subunit. And you're probably like, oh, that's gonna give you 80. Nope. <laughs> According to the Svedberg units, it gives you 70S ribosomal sub, uh, ribosomes in prokaryotic cells. You're probably like, okay, is that cool? I'm, I'm glad that I know that now. Why do I need to know that? Before we talk about why you need to know that, the next thing I need you guys to remember is what are ribosomes made up of? You guys need to remember this. Ribosomes contain a very specific kind of molecule, if you will, that's kind of a sitting and a part of it, very integral to its structure. What is this? It's got little like nucleotides on it. It's rRNA. So ribosomes contain two different types of things that make them up. It's equal to R, RNA, and what else? Proteins. So proteins. So when we're talking about, remember when I said in the beginning, translation requires three types of RNA? mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA. We usually just say ribosomes, but ribosomes contain rRNA and proteins. Now, why did I spend the time talking about all this stuff? <laughs> a common clinical relevance here is that they love to say, when you're talking about prokaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells, okay? We can use different types of antibiotics to target these ribosomal subunits and prokaryotic cells. For example, if I give someone an antibiotic like an amino glycoside, and there's so many different types of these, but the commonly one that you need to know is like gentamicin, and another one called tetracyclines, and there's a bunch of different types of these, doxycycline, tetracycline, minocycline, all those. These love to target and inhibit the translation process by affecting the 30S ribosomal subunit. So they inhibit the activity of the 30S ribosomal subunit in prokaryotic cells. The other antibiotics is going to be particularly, not the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines, but let's say that we're talking particularly about something called macrolides. And these are things like azithromycin, clarithromycin, erythromycin. These love to target and inhibit the activity of the 50S ribosomal subunit in prokaryotes, which inhibits protein synthesis. Think about this. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria, let's ex use this example like bacteria, need proteins in order for them to function. If you give an antibiotic, if a bacteria is infecting a particular tissue, you give them an antibiotic, something like an aminoglycoside, a tetracycline, or a macrolide, it's going to inhibit these ribosomal subunits. You can't now use them to make proteins. If you can't make proteins, the bacteria will die. So you see how there's a clinical relevance to something at the molecular level. Okay, we've gone through all the players that we really need to understand and know for translation. We went through the mRNA, we went through the tRNA, we went through the ribosomes and the rRNA. Now let's head at home and talk about the phases of translation. All right, so we're gonna talk about the phases of translation. We've really built up our foundation to understand translation now. So there's three phases of translation. The first phase that we're gonna go through is called initiation. So what's the first that we're gonna talk about here called? The first phase we're gonna discuss is called initiation of translation. And it's probably like, a, a, it's really, it's, it's not that hard. It's a really simple step. We have to kind of discuss though, the differences between prokaryotic initiation and translation and eukaryotic initiation and translation. So let's first talk about um, uh, prokaryotes because they're easier. So here's our mRNA, right? And on the mRNA, again, what do you have? You'll have a five prime end and you'll have a three prime end. And let's just kind of a, a, a right here now that this is specific for prokaryotes, okay? We're talking about this for prokaryotes right now. Let's say here on the prokaryote is my start codon. And what are your start codons? We didn't talk about that yet, did we? But there is a particular start codon. We kind of talked about it a little bit. What I want you to remember is that your start codons, we talked about there were 64 different types of codons, 61 code for amino acids and three don't, they're stop. A start codon, we did kind of talk about it, is AUG. Do you guys remember what AUG coded for? Methionine, right? So methionine, but here's the difference. This is an important thing to talk about. 
and they'll, they'll probably throw this on an exam. For prokaryotic cells, it's technically not methionine. It's called informal methionine. So what is it called? Informal methionine. Okay, we'll put met. <clears throat> So again, the start codon is AUG in prokaryotic cells, same as it is for in eukaryotic cells. But what it codes for is not methionine like it is in eukaryotic cells, it's called informal methionine. Sometimes it's even abbreviated as FMET, okay? Either way, that's my start codon. So we're gonna put here AUG. On this mRNA, there is a sequence of nucleotides, particularly like purines, that are a couple uh, nucleotide bases upstream towards the five prime end from that start codon. And for whatever reason, they love to give this a particular name because this is where your ribosomes, a lot of initiation factors, things like that bind and recognize the mRNA in the prokaryotic cells and bind, it helps to start the translation process. And this sequence that's a, like eight nucleotides upstream from the AUG is called the Shine Delgarno sequence, okay? And if you really wanna know, it contains a lot of A's, adenines, and guanines, okay? So it contains a lot of adenine and guanines or your purine nucleotides in that region, okay? So there's a shine delgarno sequence. It's kind of like an identifier on the mRNA. And what happens is a couple things. First thing is you have your small ribosomal subunit, okay? Your small ribosomal subunit will come and bind to this area, right? And what happens is when it binds to the area here on the mRNA, it uses a very special type of protein. Let's represent these in brown. Actually, no, let's do it in pink so it's kind of different here. There's these things called initiation factors. And there's these initiation factors that recognize the shine delgarno sequence that are in the small ribosomal subunit, or bounds of the small ribosomal subunit. And so what happens is the initiation factors in the small ribosomal subunit will bind the shine delgarno sequence. Then once it does that, it starts kind of moving towards the start codon. So two things happen these pink things called initiation factors that are associated with the small ribosomal subunit will identify the shine delgarno sequence. When they bind, they then move down about eight nucleotides until they hit the start codon, which is AUG. That's the first thing, okay? So if we wanted to kind of show that, that's the first event to happen. Let's put one here. First event, event to happen is initiation factors and small ribosomal subunits bind shine delgarno, move down until they hit the AUG. The second thing to happen here is that there's a molecule called tRNA, right? And tRNA is gonna have to have anticodons specific to this AUG, which is UAC. And it'll be carrying with it an amino acid. What is that amino acid? Specific, we already kind of talked about it. We're gonna abbreviate it called FMET. Now, when the tRNA comes, what is this called? This is your tRNA containing the FMET. When it comes and it has its anticodons interact with the codons here, there's something that helped to bring it or drag it into this area. What do you think that is? Let's represent another little pink color. There's a pink protein that kind of helps to yank that uh, tRNA, the initiator tRNA, right, which contains the FMET, and bring it into where the start codon is. What is that pink protein called? It's called an initiation factor. That's it. So, first step, initiation factor, small ribosomal subunit, bind shine delgarno, move down till they hit the start codon. Second step, initiator tRNA in the prokaryotes, which contains tRNA and N-formal methionine with a initiation factor come to the area where the start codon is and bind. That's the second step. Third step, <laughs> there is a molecule bound to this initiation factor. And that molecule is called, let's bring it over here, a GTP. This GTP is a high energy molecule. What's gonna happen is this initiation factor will break down the GTP into GDP and an inorganic phosphate. And that'll create a lot of energy. 
And what happens is at the same time the GTP gets broken down into G D GDP and inorganic phosphate, the large ribosomal subunit, we'll represent it like this, the large ribosomal subunit will come over and bind to this area. And so what will it look like if we had kind of like showing all of this happen here, this process and the large ribosomal subunit coming in here, this would be in your third step. So third step here is GTP gets broken down to GDP and inorganic phosphate and the large ribosomal subunit comes and gets added in. What would be the final thing that it would look like if we drew it down here? If we drew it all down here at the end product here, you would have what? Large ribosomal subunit, small ribosomal subunit bound here. Then what else would we have? We would have the tRNA kind of sitting in here with the F informal methionine bound with the codon. In this case, it would be AUG. And then what would we have released during this process? We would have released GDP and an inorganic phosphate. And what else would we release? We don't need this thing anymore. We don't need this pink protein anymore. The initiation factors. We can just spit those out as well. So we can spit out the initiation factors as well. What are these things called? We're just going to abbreviate them initiation factors. So to recap really quick, because I know it was a lot of crap in one thing. Shine Del Garno sequence, identifier of the mRNA. Small ribosomal subunits, initiation factors, bind to it, identify it, move down till they hit the start. Second thing, tRNA, which contains the FMET, right, which is particularly based upon the anticodons complementary to the codons in mRNA. It gets brought to this area by the initiation factors. They bring it to the area and bind the tRNA. Then, third step, there's a GTP associated with the initiation factors. It gets broken down into GDP and inorganic phosphate. At the same time, a large ribosomal subunit will bind, and what will you get? At that process, you'll get the large and small bound to the mRNA with the tRNA sitting in the ribosome in what site? We didn't talk about this yet, but there's three sites in a ribosome. One of them, if we start them here, this first one is called the A site. That's the kind of the arrival site. This one is called the P site. And this one is called the E site. And we'll go through these all in detail. But that tRNA is going to be sitting right smack dab in the middle, which is going to be the P site. Okay? So that covers the initiation and prokaryotic cells. Thank goodness in eukaryotic cells, it's pretty much the same. We just give different names for stuff. So this step here in initiation, this is for particularly what? Eukaryotic cells. They still have a five prime end and a three prime end. But guess what? They don't have a shine Delgarno sequence. They just have this start code on. What happens is, first thing that happens, is you have a molecule called a eukaryotic initiation factor. <laughs> so a eukaryotic initiation factor will come and bind to this five prime end. And we call this eukaryotic initiation factor type four. It'll bind to this five prime end, okay? That's the first thing that'll happen. The second thing that'll happen is that you'll have your small ribosomal subunit and other you know, initiation factors that we're not too concerned with just yet that'll come in, interact with this mRNA. So let's draw here your small ribosomal subunit. That'll come and bind. That's the second thing that'll happen. And then what else is happening? You're having some initiation factors, some small little initiation factors that'll help that small ribosomal subunit to bind to the mRNA. This, the third thing that happens, okay, so so far we've had two things happen. Eukaryotic initiation factor type 4 identifies the mRNA. Second thing is the small ribosomal subunit with the initiation factors bind to the mRNA. The third thing to happen is that you have a eukaryotic initiation factor type 2. Eukaryotic initiation factor type 2 that will bind your tRNA. Right? It'll bind the tRNA that contains anticodons that are complementary to the codons in mRNA, which is UAC. It'll have an amino acid that'll be based off of that start codon. What is it in eukaryotic cells? 
What is the start code on in eukaryotic cells? It's the same one we talked about in prokaryotes, right? AUG, what's the difference? AUG and eukaryotes codes for methionine, not informal methionine. That's all that's different. So this is just methionine. Eukaryotic initiation factor type two will bring with it the tRNA with the methionine and bind it to this portion on the star codon. The fourth thing to happen here is that you have a GTP molecule that is going to be bound to the eukaryotic initiation factor type two. This is the fourth thing. It's going to get broken down into GDP and an inorganic phosphate. And the other event to happen here is that the large ribosomal subunit, which contains the E site, P site, A site, will come and bind to the mRNA. And what will it look like if all of this stuff kind of happens accordingly? You'll have here your large ribosomal subunit with the E site, P site, A site, small ribosomal subunit. You'll have the tRNA, which will have its anticodons complementary to the codons of the mRNA, and you'll have your methionine sitting there. And what would be of release, because we don't need them anymore, in this process? We would release the GDP and the inorganic phosphate, and we would also release the eukaryotic initiation factors, right? Like type 2 and type 4. Do you see how it's pretty much the same in prokaryotic cells? The only difference is, is that in order to start this, you have a shine delgarno sequence that's identified by initiation factors. And eukaryotes, it's a eukaryotic initiation factor that binds the five prime end, okay? The other thing is, you still have a tRNA that's coming in and binding with initiation factors to where that start codon is. The only difference is, is that's informal methionine, and eukaryotic cells is called methionine. And these are just called initiation factors. This one's called eukaryotic initiation factor type two. They just wanted to be annoying. But the same thing happens in the remaining steps, which is the large ribosomal subunit has to bind, and you have to break down GTP into GDP and an inorganic phosphate, and you have to release the initiation factors. All of it's the same with just some minor changes in it. That's it. We finished initiation, thank the Lord. Now. Let's move on to the next step, which is called elongation. So what's the next step that we're gonna talk about here? The next step is probably one of the more difficult ones to kind of visualize, but this is called elongation. This is the second phase in translation. So let's pick up where we left off. We initiated the translation process. Let's pretend this is the same, thank, thank goodness. This is the same in eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells, but we're gonna use a lot of the examples here in eukaryotic cells. So this is primarily gonna be used in eukaryotic cells that we're going to be using this as an example. And it's because we're gonna be using particular types of factors. Okay, so in this example, just so you know, it's the same in prokaryotes and, and eukaryotes. Just in this example, I'm going over it in eukaryotes because I'm gonna use specific factors and you'll see what I mean. So to see if you guys remember everything we just talked about up here, you had to initiate it, right? Small ribosomal, large ribosomal have to bind. Initiation factors help that process. Break down GTP into inorganic phosphate <clears throat> and bring a tRNA which contains a amino acid, the initiator tRNA, which is gonna be informal methionine in prokaryotes and methionine in eukaryotes. In this example, what was our start codon? AUG, what would be the anticodons that are complementary to that on the tRNA? UAC, okay? That's where we are. We just finished the initiation. Now what we're gonna do is, okay, we have to quickly review what is this site here? The A site. Now, if you really want to know, the A site is called the amino acyl site. P site is called the peptidyl site. And E is called the exit site. You can remember APE in that order, okay? Because that's the order we're going to have things coming in and leaving. So, A site is, I like to remember, the arrival site. P site, I like to think about as the synthesis site. And E, I like to think about as the exit site. That's how I remember them, okay? So the first thing that we have to do with this elongation process is we have to bring something into the A site. 
Let's just make up, we used isoleucine as an example over there. Let's bring them back. Let's put here AUA -A as the next codon that I'm going to read. If that's the case, then what do I need to bring into this area? A tRNA. In order for me to bring a tRNA that is, has anticodons specific to that, let's draw that in bringing him in here. So we're gonna have him come into this step here. So we're gonna bring in, what are the uh, anticodons to this? U, A, U, right? If you really wanted to be specific according to the wobble effect, what would it be? The inosine, but just in this example, we're gonna put U, A, U. Okay, this is gonna be containing <clears throat> what? An amino acid. And that amino acid in this example, it doesn't really matter, but it's called isoleucine, since we talked about that one before. Now, in order to bring this tRNA into this A site, we need something to help bring it to that area. And that is going to be called an elongation factor. So it's called a elongation factor. It's called eukaryotic elongation factor type one. Eukaryotic elongation factor type one will bind this tRNA, which is gonna have anticodons complementary to these codons on the mRNA in the A site. Now, once that happens, let's show what that would look like. So here, we're still gonna have that same initiator tRNA right here, right? which contains the methionine. And if you really wanted to know here, this would be UAC, and then what would these codons be? AUG, this is the P site. In the A site, what does it look like? AUA is my codons, and then with the help of the eukaryotic elongation factor type one, he brings in the tRNA that's complementary to this one. So that's going to have tRNA, which is UAU. And again, if you really wanted to be specific according to that wobble effect, it would technically be UAI, if you really wanted to. But it's gonna contain the isoleucine in the A site. Who helped to bring him into this area? The eukaryotic elongation factor type one. But guess what else? This eukaryotic elongation factor on its back, it's got a GTP molecule. And really, in order for this guy to get in there and to bind, what do I need to have enabling this process, energy. So on the back of this molecule, we have GTP. When we add him in here, and he finally gets added in, what do I spit out? I spit out GDP in an inorganic phosphate, and what else do I spit out? My eukaryotic elongation factor type one, okay? And now I have my tRNA in this spot. Here's where it gets a little interesting, because now what do I need to do? I need to take this amino acid that is bound to the tRNA in the P site and transfer it onto the amino acid of the tRNA in the A site, and then I need to shift this one that's in the A site into the P site and shift the one that's in the P site into the E site. You're probably like, holy crap, Zach, that's too much. We're gonna go through it. So how does this work? It's really cool. I'm gonna show you in a very generic way, and then we're gonna show it in a zoomed in way because it is important that you understand this. What happens is, there is a, a little kind of like uh, nitrogen on this amino acid here. And what, what was this one, if you really wanted to remember? Isoleucine. That nitrogen comes over and attacks the carbon end on this amino acid that's in the P site. And you know those like little things when you were a kid, they were like the little sticky things with the hands on the end of it and you can throw it, it could stick to something and kind of like suck it back in. That's kind of what this guy is doing. It's going and it's grabbing the amino acid in the P site and sucking it back onto it in the A site. And then what would it look like if we kind of did that process? So let's say that we did this process here. What would that look like? If this were to be, if this were to occur, that amino acid would be gone because I transferred it over to this guy in the A site. Isn't that cool? So now in the A site, I'm going to have the amino acids, two amino acids. The one that was originally coming from the, uh, the isoleucine, right, which was brought in in this step, and the amino acid methionine that came in from the initiation step in the A site. Now, what does that look like kind of in a zoomed in view? 
If we were to really take these and zoom in on them in a really kind of like zoomed in view, here is my isoleucine. And on this end, it has a N-terminus. Same thing over here from methionine, it has a N-terminus. And then on this end, if you really wanted to know, it has a carboxy terminus. Same thing here, it has a carboxy terminus. The N-terminus of the isoleucine nucleophilically attacks the carboxy group on the methionine. And then again, sucks it back into where that area is, like the little kind of like hands, the sticky hands that yank it back in. In order for this process to occur, the ribosome has an enzyme kind of intrinsically associated with it. And this enzyme is called uh, a peptidyl transferase. Pretty ironic, right? So the peptidyl transferase, which is kind of like, imagine here that the, that's kind of associated in this kind of uh, ribosome, it's the one that's gonna be helping to perform this process, taking and catalyzing it. So this step that we just talked about is catalyzed by an enzyme intrinsic to the ribosome, which is called the peptidyl transferase, okay? So we brought in a new tRNA into the A site. We used the peptidyl transferase to catalyze this step where this amino acid in the P site gets added onto the amino acid in the A site. All right, so now we've already kind of done this little peptidyl reaction where we transfer to this amino acid from the tRNA in the P site onto the amino acid of the tRNA in the A site. What would that look like over here then after this process occurred, which was catalyzed by the peptidyl transferase in the ribosome? It would look like this. So here we'd have our tRNA, and would it have a, here let's just represent by an X. Does it have an amino acid? No, it's gone because we transferred it. Then over here, and that's in the P site. Here in the A site, what would it look like? Well now we would have that tRNA, and it would have the amino acid, isoleucine, first, and then it would have the next amino acid that was added onto it, which is the methionine, right? That's it. Now, what did I say that we had to do? That was the first thing I said we had to do in this kind of elongation process. The second thing that we have to do is something called, so we did kind of this like peptidyl reaction. Now we have to do something called translocation. So the next step here is called translocation. And that's basically just kind of like moving things along, moving whatever was in the P site into the E site. Moving what was in the A site into the P site, that's all it is. But in order for this to happen, I need energy to generate this process. So what happens is I have this, in, uh, not an enzyme, but a kind of a factor here called a eukaryotic elongation factor type two. And this eukaryotic elongation factor type two contains a molecule called GTP. We need that energy, baby. So it brings in this GTP and puts the GTP into this reaction, which breaks it into GDP and inorganic phosphate. So this guy brings them, the eukaryotic elongation factor type two, brings the GTP to this area where the ribosome and mRNA are interacting, creates energy, and then shifts what was in the A site into the P site, what was in the P site into the E site. What would that look like? Then, come over here, this should be in the E site which is my tRNA with no amino acid bound to it. And the P site, what would I have? I'd have my tRNA, which contains the isoleucine and the methionine. What would I have in the A site? Nothing. All right, so now that we've kind of moved and shifted or translocated the tRNA that was in that P site into the E site, eventually, because of that energy I generated, I'm also just gonna spit it out. Right, I'm gonna spit it out of the E site. And so now this is no longer gonna be associated with the mRNA and the ribosomes. It's gonna be spit out and it'll go back up. Remember in the tRNA charging? It'll go back up and it'll get charged, get a new amino acid on, added onto it, and then it'll come back into the A site eventually. But after we spit that tRNA out that we have finished, what does it look like? We'll come up here, right? If, so what do we, we, do, we spit out the tRNA out of the E site, come back to this point here. We now have, if we were to take from this point, what was the difference from when we started? We just added on an amino acid. So now the only difference here is that I have a amino acid added on to a tRNA in the P site. Then what would I do? 
I'd have another eukaryotic elongation factor bring another amino acid into the A site. I'd have that, then do what? Have that amino acid in the A site attack the amino acids in the P site, pull them over. When they pull them over, that's catalyzed by the peptidyl transferase. Then I'll use GTP to shift the amino acids at this point, which would be now what? Three in the A site into the P site. Then after I do that, I'd spit the tRNA that I already used out of the E site, and then I'd come back and I'd have three amino acids. And then I would just keep doing this process and going and going and going as I continue to elongate my peptide. Eventually though, you hit a certain point. So let's pretend this tRNA has been going ham and you've just been bringing in tons and tons and tons of uh, amino acids. And by this time, it's, it'll starting to look like this because you've gone through that elongation step like you know a thousand times at this point. And you got a nice long peptide at this point, okay? Because you've gone through this step multiple times. Eventually, again, we're in the P site here, E site, A site. Eventually, you come to the third phase of translation, which is called termination. Termination. Eventually, you hit a stop codon, okay? And let's say that we used any of the three stop codons. Do you guys remember the thing, that the memory trick? You go away. You are away. You are gone. If at any point in time you get a you are away, you all go away, you are gone, in that A site, am I gonna have a tRNA come in and interact? No. No tRNA will be coming into this step, sir. So no tRNA with an amino acid will be brought into this step. Instead, what am I gonna bring in? I'm gonna bring in something called a release factor. So I'm gonna bring in something called a release factor. A release factor has like a little pocket, if you will, that'll come in and interact with that UAG, that stop codon. It'll then prevent the ribosome from continuing to move along the mRNA, continuing to translate it. So it'll bind to the stop codon, stop the translation process, and then what? Shing! Cleave, shiatsu, that peptide, away from the tRNA that's in the P site. So what else will it do? It does three things. What I want you to remember. Binds the stop codon. Second thing is it stops translation. Third thing is it cuts peptide in P site. So then from here, that release factor would then use its little shiatsu and cut that bond right there, separating the tRNA from the peptide. And then what will happen? <clears throat> this peptide will then get released. And then from there, once we've released this peptide, it can go and do whatever it needs to do. Maybe it's gonna get incorporated into the cell membrane. Maybe it's gonna be in the cytosol. Maybe it's gonna be secreted. We don't really care at this point. We just know that we terminated the translation process, utilizing a release factor to identify the stop codon, stop the ribosome from moving along the mRNA, and then cleaving the peptide from the tRNA and stopping the translation process. But now what I wanna talk about is that this, this translation process can occur on what's called free ribosomes or it can occur on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So we have to understand the differences between those two processes. So let's go talk about that now. All right, engineers, so we've gone through, we've built up the foundation talking about mRNA, tRNA, rRNA, ribosomes. We talked about the genetic code. We went through the phases of translation. And we talked about particularly how translation is occurring on ribosomes, right? With the mRNA, the tRNA, we talked about all that stuff. But here's the thing, translation or protein synthesis can occur on ribosomes that are just kind of like freely circulating in our cytosol, our cytoplasm, or it can occur on membrane bound ribosomes, which are bound to what's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And you guys should be asking, when do I do it on the rough ER? When do I do it on the, in the cytoplasm? And we'll answer that.
because it's, it's a good question. For the most part, the simple answer is that when it occurs on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, that is for proteins that are either going to be secreted from the cell, incorporated into the cell membrane, or proteins that are going to become incorporated into lysosomes. So three reasons why it would occur on the rough ER and not in the free ribosomes is secreting the protein, embedding it into the membrane, and becoming a part of lysosomes. So now let's talk about the difference between the translation process that occurring on a free ribosome and when it has to bind or translocate from that cytosol where it's a free ribosome to a membrane bound ribosome. There's a, a very important process that we have to talk about. So let's pretend here that we're covering this. It's the same thing that we've already gone over. You've taken DNA and you transcribed it. When you transcribed it, you made it into mRNA. Right, so we took and you made mRNA. The mRNA was then gone through all its modification, got spit out of the nucleus and came into the cytosol and bound with a ribosome. Starts getting translated. We've already gone through it. It goes through the initiation, elongation process, and it's making these peptides that are coming out of what site? The P site, right? As it's synthesizing these peptides, there's about a sequence of amino acids, about maybe nine to 10 amino acids, that become an identifier on this peptide. And this is represented by the orange portion. So we're, con we're translating it, just like we did over here. We're just continuing to go through the elongation steps and making a long peptide. There's a sequence of amino acids on that peptide that is recognizable by a very specific protein that is kind of floating around in our cytosol. This sequence here, it's not hard, is called the signal sequence. Okay, but it's important to remember, the signal sequence is what? Amino acids. So let's write, write, make sure that we understand that this is amino acids. It's not any type of nucleotides or anything like that. It's amino acids. We're making proteins, peptides, amino acids make up peptides or proteins, and you make a very specific sequence of them that is recognizable by a protein. What is that protein that's gonna be kind of floating around out here. Let's do it here in purple. There's a protein that's kind of just floating around out here and it is going to come and recognize that signal sequence. What is this called? This is called a signal recognition particle or protein. That's all it is. So this is the signal sequence. The signal recognition protein or particle will bind to the signal sequence. That's it. Once it binds, it then has a high affinity for these receptors that are located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. A very, very high affinity for these receptors that are located on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So what is this here called? Signal recognition particle will identify the signal sequence on the growing peptide from the translation process occurring on the ribosomes. Once it identifies it, it binds it and then starts dragging it towards what? This membrane here. What is this membrane here? This membrane is the rough endoplasmic reticulum membrane. Right, so if I were to kind of show that here in like a general way, let's say here, if I took a cell, I took a cell for example, here's my nucleus, here's my DNA, I make my mRNA, comes out, here's your ribosome, the mRNA will interact with the ribosomes. And then the translation process that we talked about over here was just basically occurring on that free ribosome. But if we wanted it to occur on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, that would be kind of like over here. And we'll just kind of represent this by these like lines over here. We're not gonna get too fancy. Well, what happened is we're going to move this ribosome mRNA and the growing peptide towards the rough endoplasmic reticulum membrane, which we're just zooming in on right here, okay? So if we zoom in on it, this is what we're gonna get. On that membrane are two proteins that I need you guys to know. Two proteins, that's it. This one right here is the pink protein, and this is called the signal recognition particle receptor. Not hard, that's it. So what do you think the signal recognition particle receptor is going to bind onto? The signal recognition particle, or peptide. So now let's draw that purple protein here, kind of binding here with the signal recognition particle. 
which is then bound to what? Bound to the signal sequence. And the signal sequence is from the growing peptide. So here we're gonna show kind of like our ribosome here. Here's the large, here's the small, and then what's gonna be kind of in between here, sandwiched between it that's getting red right now? The mRNA. And if we were to just kind of show this here, here's our protein that's being kind of synthesized out of here, and there's one particular thing that's on the end of it, which is what? The signal sequence. And the signal sequence is bound to the signal recognition particle, which is bound to the signal recognition protein receptor. That's it. Okay, after that process occurs, this molecule right here, this protein that we haven't talked about yet, this black protein here is called the translocon. This protein is called the translocon. Now, in this state, right, the translocon is closed. Nothing has kind of triggered it to open yet. It is closed. So signal recognition particle binds the signal sequence, brings it towards the rough ER, binds it with the receptor, and the translocon is still closed. How do I get that translocon to open? Let me explain how. Here's my signal recognition protein or particle receptor. I know this is a lot and we're gonna just keep, it's gonna be a good review. Here bound to it is going to be the signal recognition particle. Bound to that is going to be the what? The signal sequence from the growing peptide chain. So here we will kind of just represent the growing peptide chain. And then what's gonna be over here? My ribosome, right? And my ribosome is gonna have my large, my small, and then what's sandwiched in between it? The mRNA. Good. Now, the signal recognition particle and the signal recognition protein receptor, particle receptor, contain GTP molecules bound to them. Okay? They contain GTP molecules that are bound to them. When this is bound nice and snug with each other, the GTP molecules get broken down into GDP and inorganic phosphate. So how many GTPs are we actually gonna break down in this process? Two. That's important, because they're each one are associated with the particle and the receptor. I'm gonna break these down into GDP and inorganic phosphate. Break this one down to GDP and inorganic phosphate. That's breaking down two total GTPs in order for this process to occur. When I break that down, what happens to the translocon? Do you guys see? The translocon was closed, it was still closed here. So the translocon was still closed in these two states. But once I broke down the GTP into GDP and inorganic phosphate, I created energy. And what happens to the translocon? Once this happens, the translocon opens because it was dependent upon breaking down the GTP into GDP and what? An inorganic phosphate, okay? Now the translocon is opened. What do you think I'm gonna do? I'm not gonna draw all this stuff here again because we don't really need to know that. We open, you know, the whole thing that we talked about is the same. I'm just gonna continue to keep taking that ribosome. Here, we'll, we'll just draw the ribosome. The ribosome is gonna kind of really line up perfectly like this. It's gonna line up perfectly with the translocon. And now that peptide that was growing it's just gonna kind of get pushed right through the translocon into what? This whole thing, this whole thing right here is the lumen of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. All in that, it's just gonna get start getting pushed into the lumen of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So I'm gonna have this peptide getting pushed in here, and what was at the end of that peptide? What was there? The signal recognition, I'm sorry, the signal sequence. So here I'm gonna have that signal sequence. Now, since the signal sequence is kind of inside the lumen at this point, do I need my signal recognition particle anymore? No. So what can I do? Spit him off. Go back and bind another ribosome and bring him here to, you know, to another site. So what will I spit off right here? I'm gonna spit off also in this step my signal recognition particle. I don't need him. Once I start having this growing peptide line up with the translocon, the peptide gets pushed into the lumen, there's another little freaky little enzyme in here that loves to identify the signal sequence and cut him off so that we don't have him in there anymore because we don't need him. He was primarily needed just to bring the peptide, the ribosome, to the rough ER. We don't need him for anything else. So this enzyme 
beautiful, cute little enzyme that's inverted is called a signal peptidase. Thank goodness that's an easy name, right? And he comes over here and he cuts off the signal sequence. And when he cuts off the signal sequence, that signal sequence will just kind of get spit off over here and there's gonna be some enzymes that'll come and degrade that signal sequence into amino acids because we don't need them. But what happens is that peptide is just gonna to continue to keep going and being translated and translated and translated through the elongation process until what happens? Till we hit a stop codon. You go away. You are away. You are gone, right? Remember that little trick. Once you hit that stop codon, translation ceases. And what do you do? This was once lined up, continuing to push the peptide in. Continuing to push the peptide into the cell. We already broke off the signal sequence, so we don't have that anymore. Once you hit the translation process, that stop codon, the translation will stop occurring, the translocon will close, and the ribosomal subunits and the mRNA will disassociate away from this site. So what happens? The translocon closes, the peptide is released into what? Into the rough endoplasmic reticulum's lumen. Into rough ER lumen. And then the ribosomes and the mRNA will disassociate, okay? And they'll actually go and get degraded as well. That is because, why does this happen? Because at this point you hit a stop codon. And once you hit that stop codon, it terminates the translation process, closes the translocon, releases the peptide with no signal sequence on it into the rough ER lumen, and then the ribosomes and the mRNA will disassociate. And that's covered the ribosomal translocation process. Now, really quickly, when you have this process, ribosomal translocation, coming and binding with the rough ER, I want you to know why. And we already talked about the three reasons why this would occur. It's proteins that are gonna be secreted, proteins, and that's why, because they need to go to the rough ER. Then to the Golgi, make a vesicle, and then go and get excreted, or get incorporated into the membrane. Second thing is they're gonna be a membrane protein. And the last reason is that they'll become lysosomal proteins. Okay, these are the three reasons why it would be rough ER ribosomes. Okay, I need you guys to know that. And it's a really simple process because whenever, if you guys know, come back to this diagram over here, if I take a protein, it gets synthesized in the rough ER, then where does it have to go? To the Golgi. Then from the Golgi, it has to get packaged into vesicles. And those vesicles can either go to the cell membrane, get incorporated, go to the cell membrane, get excreted, or they can become a lysosome, okay? So that's the whole purpose of why we go through that process with the rough ER. What about the other ones? I know you guys are probably like, well, Zach, what about all that free ribosomes that don't bind to the rough ER? What, 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 how, where do they go? What do they do? If we talked about, let's say that we kind of use a line here and say that these structures are where the proteins are gonna be incorporated into. These are gonna come from free ribosomes. And the ones that we already talked about, these proteins that'll either be incorporated into cell membrane, secreted, or become lysosomes, are gonna be rough ER ribosomes. We already know the ones for the rough ER. Secreted proteins, membrane proteins, lysosomal proteins. What about the free ribosomes? Where are those proteins gonna go? If it's just in the free ribosomes, these proteins will be for cytosolic proteins. What are the reasons that we have cytosolic proteins? Just use a very simple example. A lot of the metabolic processes that occur in the cell, glycolysis that occurs in the cytoplasm, some of the other steps that occur in the cytoplasm, we need those proteins to catalyze things that are in the cytosol. The second one, proteins that are incorporated into the nucleus, different types of enzymes that are involved in, things that are involved in DNA transcription, things that are involved in replication and modification of things. So we also need them for nuclear proteins. Proteins that are actually gonna be 
involved in the mitochondrial processes, certain metabolic processes that are involved there. So mitochondrial enzymes. And the last one is enzymes that are very, very important, catalases and a bunch of other enzymes that are involved within peroxisomes. So peroxisomal enzymes. Okay, very, very important to remember those things. Okay, so free ribosomes gives way to cytosol, nuclear, mitochondrial, peroxisomal proteins, and rough ER gives way to membrane-bound proteins, lysosomes, and excreted proteins. Simple as that. We've now made the protein. We've either got it, uh, we've either made the protein via the free ribosomes, or we've made the proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now what do we gotta do? We gotta modify the protein a couple different ways. Let's talk about that very briefly. All right guys, so at this point in time, we have gone from DNA, we transcribed it, we made mRNA, then we translated and made proteins. In this case, we made a protein. We went through all of these stages in sequence of videos, transcription and then translation in this video. Now what we're gonna do is we gotta take this protein that we've synthesized, whether it was via the free ribosomes or whether it was via the rough endoplasmic reticulum ribosomes, and we have to modify them a little bit. In other words, we add things on or cut things off. That's it, add on, cut off. Let's give some examples. We're not gonna go too ham. Let's say on one of these, I add a sugar residue. I'm just gonna represent that with a G. What is this called when you add a sugar residue onto a protein? Glycosylation. So that could be a reaction called glycosylation. And we'll talk about a couple examples of these very briefly a little bit later. But that's one thing. I add a sugar residue onto these proteins. The next thing I could do is I could add a lipid onto these proteins. What do you think that's called? Lipidation. So here, we'll just kind of represent like this. Little thing called lipidation. And we'll talk about reasons that this is important. The next thing we could do is we could add on a phosphate groups. So we could add on phosphate groups. So we'll just kind of show here phosphate groups. What is this called? Phosphorylation. We could add on hydroxyl groups. What is this called? Hydroxylation. Okay. What else could I do? I could add on like a methyl group. Here, let's put down a couple of methyl group. I could add acetyl group. Or I could cut some, uh, some of the amino acids off. So let's put cut or trim some of the amino acids off. So what would this be called if I add a methyl group on? This is called methylation. What would it be called if I added an acetyl group on? Not hard, right? An acetyl group, you would call that acetylation. And the last thing is I could cut. So here I would just represent, maybe I'm gonna cut some of these amino acids out of the reaction. If I cut some of these amino acids off, okay, what is that called? That's called trimming. We actually specifically, we call that trimming. Now, these are the basic, kind of most important types of modifications that you truly need to know for when you're taking a protein and doing things to it. But glycosylation, lipidation, phosphorylation, hydroxylation, methylation, acetylation, and trimming, what are examples of those? That's kind of the big thing that you really should know. I'm not gonna go ham on it, but just think about examples. If I took a protein and I added a sugar residue onto it, what would be a reason that I would wanna do that? The best example that I can think of is antigens. Okay, so you know in your, like your red blood cells, your red blood cells, you have different antigens like A antigens, B antigens, RH antigens. Those have sugar residues on them. They're proteins with sugar residues on them. And they help to identify what's, what type of protein that this has on it, which can determine your blood type. Right? So that's an example. So it can be good for identifying particular proteins or antigens specific to a cell. Also good for transporters. You know, transporters, different types of uh, channels like glut channels that we talked about in this membrane transport or other different types of voltage-gated ion channels. Those can sometimes have some sugar residues on them. Lipidation. These are good for proteins that are going to be incorporated into the cell membrane. So... These are gonna be, lipid proteins are good for cell membrane as well as 
organelle membranes. For example, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, that's a, that's a phospholipid bilayer, which we could use some proteins with sugar, uh, uh, lipid residues on them. The Golgi, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, things like that, or the cell membrane itself. Phosphorylation, this is a really big one. I really need you guys to remember these. Use the example that we've talked about like a million times, like protein kinase A, or uh, cyclin-dependent kinases, things like that we've talked about a lot in other videos. These guys add phosphate groups, right? So if you had a protein here and we added a phosphate group, that could either activate the protein or it could inhibit the protein. And that's important in a lot of cells, like you know your cell cycle? When you go from your G1 to your S phase to your G2 phase through mitosis, we phosphorylate particular proteins that modulate that activity or modulate cellular signaling pathways. So this is very, very important. Hydroxylation is very, very key for making collagen. Collagen synthesis. Collagen is extremely important because it's incorporated into our bones, our cartilage, our connective tissue, our basement membranes. And hydroxylation is one of the biggest ways that we make collagen, okay? Methylation, acetylation. This is best talked about, and I know you ninja nerds know this. We literally just talked about it in DNA structure, in organization. If I methylate, a histone protein, what do you do if you add a methyl group onto it? Does it decrease transcription or increase it? Keeps the interaction tight. So is it, can an RNA polymerase fit between that? No. So that would decrease transcription. If I put an acetyl group onto it, it relaxes the DNA, increases the space the RNA polymerase can come in, read it, and does what? Increases the transcription. So something as simple as modifying our protein in that way can make a huge difference. And my favorite example is trimming. I like to think about this as, let's say that you just work, worked out, you got yourself some gains, you're gonna go home and eat chicken breast, you know, that tastes like a bike tire, because you know, they're, you know, sometimes chicken isn't that good. But anyway, you're getting, trying to get your gains, you're getting your protein, and when you do that, the protein gets into your small intestine, and you have a particular enzyme called trypsinogen. You know the enzyme called trypsinogen? trypsinogen, it's kind of like the precursor. It's not active. But if I take and I use an enzyme that cuts the trypsinogen and turns him into trypsin, I'm gonna cut a piece of it. This is the inactive protease. This is the active protease. If I activate him by cutting some pieces off of him, now he can go and shiatsu the proteins that I ate from the chicken so that I can absorb it. That's kind of the simple examples of how we can modify proteins that they can either become activated, deactivated, be incorporated into a membrane, be uh, particularly an antigen, all these different things. So that's taking proteins and modifying in a way for particular cellular examples. And that concludes our video on translation or protein synthesis. All right, engineers, in this video today, we talk about translation or protein synthesis. I hope it made sense, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. All right, engineers, as always, until next time. Thank you.